This is Things Police See, First Hand Accounts, with your host, Steve Gould. Welcome to the podcast that interviews active and retired police officers about their most intense, bizarre, and sometimes humorous moments on the job. As the man said, I'm Steve Gould. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Thank you for uh, for being here. If you're if you're a, a repeat listener, I really appreciate it. If you're brand new to the show, just as the intro said, you will hear the most uh, raw and unedited police stories here, what the men and women of law enforcement actually <clears throat> deal with and see on a daily basis. So that's what that's what you're in for. I am uh, very grateful for all the five stars on Apple Podcasts we've been getting. I really want to get to um, a thousand. We're at like nine hundred and forty something, which is great. But if we just get to that one k, I would be so I'm so happy. Uh, what else has been going on with me? I uh, went to the Y today. And have you ever played basketball with children? Because I noticed they don't uh, they don't sweat and they don't get tired, and I'm the exact opposite of that. So I'm I'm pretty beat. I'm pretty pink. If you watch the YouTube channel, you can see exactly how pink I am. I got a new camera, and uh, it's like about as fancy as you can get for a web camera. So it's not a great camera, but it's pretty okay. It lets you like adjust things. And before the show, I was adjusting it like crazy. I'm like, why am I? Why is my face so pink? And I had to go to the bathroom, so I went upstairs, <clears throat> and I'm like, my face is just pink. <laughs> No, uh, no amount of tweaking to the camera is going to fix my, uh, my pink face. So I've been trying to, I've been trying to be healthier lately. It's important in, you know, when you're in law enforcement, it's important not to put weight on too quickly because all of our uniforms are, are pretty tailored to us. So I've been doing like smoothies. You've probably seen that on my Facebook page or the, um, Instagram and on Patreon and, uh, I'm fasting, I'm doing intermittent fasting and it's been working great, but the smoothies with you hit, with you hit a intermittent fast with a smoothie. It's like a brick in your stomach. So my wife and I ordered, um, or we got a, a case of, uh, magic mind. It's like this little shot of nootropics. If you listen to Joe Rogan a lot, you know, nootropics are what you're supposed to be doing because he never shuts up about it. And, uh, I'm always hesitant to try these things because when I was like into lifting and exercising, uh, ephedra was the thing. And I took a lot of ephedra which is basically like um, amphetamine. <laughs> and I remember seeing like frames in the gym and uh, my heart was palpitating. But anyways, see Magic Mind everywhere. I get a case of my wife and I did it for um, a seven-day stint. And I can tell you without reservation that the stuff's really good. Like I was getting sick of the stomachache I got from the smoothie. So I'd break my fast with coffee and then I would have uh, the Magic Mind um, with it. And it's a really good clean, uh, doesn't upset your stomach. It doesn't make you jittery, like too much coffee. It's, it's good stuff. And I wouldn't tell you that unless I meant it. I did me and my wife tested it. She has autoimmune and she has celiac and she took it and she actually, she's a huge, huge fanatic about it now. So that's my tip to you is magic mind for the week. Um, if you're into it, I think you save, you'll save money if you get a subscription to it. If you just buy it straight out, just buy a case, it's gonna be more money, but, um, man, it's, it's, it's helped me. I think I'm going to get back on the train with that. So guys, um, really excited for today's guest. I've been, I've been listening to this guy and I've messaged him a few times. He's a a busy man. He's a active copper and he's had a podcast for, uh, I think since 2015. So he's been in the, he's been in the game for much longer than I, I always pride myself on being since like 2018 or 17, but this guy goes further than that. I remember when I first started my podcast, I saw him cause there's very few of us and he was also in Southern California and he had like, he played radio calls like on his podcast. And I was like, how is that even possible? <laughs> what is this voodoo this man is doing? But his podcasts are, he's got a really, really great podcast. And um, let me just give you his intro. In 2005, Garrett, oh, I should have asked your brother, Tesla, uh, looks like Tesla, but it's T-E-S-L-A-A, -A, left a successful career in the music and film industry to pursue a life in public service. Garrett is now an active duty 18-year law enforcement veteran and lieutenant for a sheriff's office in Southern California. Garrett has held assignments in patrol, gang investigations, community relations, internal affairs, and media relations, among many others, and has been involved in numerous critical incidents that have received international media attention. Garrett holds a master's in public administration with emphasis in organizational leadership and public sector management and is a graduate of the Sherman Block Supervisory Leadership Institute. 
I don't know what that is, but it sounds important to me. Garrett hosts a successful podcast. This is what I was talking about. The Squad Room, devoted to personal development and for first responders. He's also a TEDx speaker and contributing writer for Police One and Law Enforcement Today. So you know him. I know him. You love him. Let's bring him on. Garrett, welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks for having me. Oh, it's, it's an honor Thank to you have here. you, man. I'm, I know you we're both busy and our schedules are, are crazy, but uh, we've been kind of connecting for the last six months uh, trying to make it happen. So I'm, I'm super pumped that you were able to come on. Uh, in your intro there, you said you worked in, uh, what were you doing in, in Los Angeles or what was your, in, in the entertainment industry? Yeah. So my, my original career, like from freshman year in high school on, like I was certain I was going to be like the next David Geffen. Uh, I wanted to run a record label. I wanted to work in the music business. I wanted to work with rock stars my, my whole life and, uh, did that from an early age, uh, in different forms. And then when I, uh, graduated from college, went, moved to New York city, worked at Atlantic records there with, uh, in Atlantic at the time in this 99, 2000 was like the label, like Matchbox 20, Kid Rock, nice. uh, Led Zeppelin, Stone Temple Pilots, Sugar nice. Ray were SDP. all there at that same time. And uh, and then eventually got it, uh, moved to Los Angeles to take a job to start a record label for a film studio there in L.A. Was doing that uh, and did that for like five, six years, was like living the best life, right? As a young 20 something with yeah. a credit uh, company credit card and Hell access yeah. to all the clubs and uh, concerts in LA. But uh, eventually uh, was looking for something different, something more, something that was more um, uh, in service. This is, you know, not, not long after nine 11 and went through the LA County Sheriff's citizens Academy and just kind of like see what it was all about. And I did a ride along and, it's like so many other stories that one ride along and I was hooked. I was like, this is what I want to do. That's cool. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was pretty wild. Uh, totally total 180, you know, yeah. in terms of a uh, career path, but have, have been appreciative of every moment of it. That's incredible, man. That's really cool. Isn't it neat how I do have um, some friends in my inner circle that make a lot of money. They make a lot of money and they think it's still so awesome that I'm a cop. They think it's like, cause it's one of those, it's a, it's an ancient profession. It's honorable and, and other guys, it, I may not be getting the money, but they, they look at it and they go, man, that's a cool job. They want to hear the stories. They want to know about it. You know what I mean? There's something about it that just is really cool. Yeah. For as much, uh, you know, uh, negative attention people think we get just look at, uh, the top TV shows that are still going on. Yeah. today you know if it's a drama it's based on a first responder profession almost certainly yeah uh, because people are still curious about it and it's such a mysterious world and we interact with the part of society that no one else gets to see that everyone's really intrigued by it and that totally is what drew me in uh, and so yeah I, I have the same experience absolutely yeah it's really cool isn't it like they're for my podcast i um obviously i repeat this i interview police officers but uh like i'll get i'll have someone contact me from you know um the Midwest or someone in a small town. And they're like, I just, I have some great stories, but I'm just afraid that like, I'm not, I'm not, uh, you know, uh, Ralph Friedman or I'm not some famous cop or I don't, I go, it doesn't matter, man. People and my friends have told me this before. People love to hear a cop talk about his job. They, they just love to hear it. Like the, even your little PD out in the sticks is like a clandestine organization to people. They're like, what goes on in there? <laughs> what do you see? Cause they know you're, you're at everything. You're at every bad thing that happens in that community. There'll be a, a copper there, you know? So it's kind of, yeah. um, it's, it's, uh, it's just really interesting people. Like that's, that's probably why we've had the success we've had with, with the show, you know what I mean? Having it out there. Um, so people can hear get a little inside baseball to police work, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I, I, you know, like for anyone who works a rural or a small department, like you can't discount the stuff that you see or that you experience as, as being less valid than if you were LAPD or, or NYPD or any of those others, because I've had plenty of interactions where, I've been in a room with people from some of those massive large agencies and we have to, this is oftentimes a training and we might have to share a critical incident we were involved in. And they will often point to my experiences as kind of mind blowing to them because we may not have the resources of an LAPD or an NYPD and we just have to get by with what we have. And, and so a lot of the rural people are doing a job that's very, very difficult, very challenging. And they just think that just because they're not one of the big ones, 
that it's a less valid experience. And that's, it's really not true. It's, it's even more so. Yeah, I agree. Totally. Where I work now, it's, um, it's a battle to, to get personnel and keep people there. And, you know, cause it's tough, like for, for a rural spot, you really want someone who's real experienced and can operate alone if they have to. Um, Mm -hmm. but is also not going to be like so bored. Like they're not, you know I mean? They're kind of in the part of the career where they're not like, you know, um, looking for the action all the time, but also not lazy. You know what I mean? It's a really hard person to find. So we end up with a lot of young guys and it's like, we run one man shifts and, um, their first bad domestic out in the woods or, um, suicide or, or just anything fatal accident. They're alone for a long time until someone gets there. That it's, it's. It, it rings kind of unfair to me. Like it's like not fair to do that to young copper, but it, th- that makes the trauma even worse when you you're the guy, you're the man for like quite a long time, especially if it, the other towns are towned up, uh, tied up and you have to have a trooper come. It could be, it could be half an hour. You know, that's, that's a long, scary moment for dealing with a call. You've only dealt with a few times. You know what I mean? And when, yeah. you, when you tell city cops that they're like, Whoa, like we have like, well, we'd have like 10 guys rolled to that. You know, we, we just, you know, they pig pile everybody and it's like, they're all, you, you're, you, if you don't have a partner, there's someone right there right away. So that's, that's something people should think about, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And you, you actually were, you, you said when we were talking uh, before the interview, you said you've kind of had a, you've kind of done the gamut. You, you have experienced kind of like the, the smaller town uh, policing and of course a, a busier area as well. Working for a sheriff's office, you can kind of move around, which is really mm-hmm. what's cool about the sheriff's office, I think. Um do you think it's split down the middle for you or do you prefer one to the other? I've always gravitated towards the more urban or suburban environments where there's just kind of a higher volume of calls. And, uh, I just, I can't sit still for very long. So I like that. Yeah. And I like being able to, you know, come in every day and it was kind of a, you know, what's going to happen today. Uh, and just the variety of stuff that comes in that environment. When I, moved to one of our more rural stations for a while, first as a sergeant, and then I later went back as the lieutenant. But I I didn't really understand how different you need to police in a rural place like that. Like if you're a one man shop like that, or for us, we weren't that small, but uh, you very, it's the kind of area where your backup could be 20 minutes out. And we have this massive geographical area that you have to think differently about how you police because of those things. Right. I don't get to have 10 cops there in a heartbeat. Uh, and, um, it was fun for its other, for other reasons. And like, it was a challenge to like develop that skill set for myself because I had to really change how I policed in that environment versus what I was used to. Right. Yeah. Uh, You're like a local celebrity, like, Hey, there's the sheriff. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> um, everyone knows you, uh, uh, good or bad and, uh, or they get to know you fast word travels that you're, uh, you're a new guy in the area. Right. It's just, and, and it's, you know, one of the things that fascinates me about policing is it, it, re- it takes all kinds, right? Like it really does. Like you need the SWAT cop who's the tactical athlete, hardcore guy, but on the other end of the spectrum, you need someone who's good with kids like an SRO. And then you need someone who's good with a budget, like a, like an admin person might be. And so all of these people are still under the, uh, under the, wear the same badge, right? Yep. Same patches on their shoulders. And it's a, such a huge diverse group of personalities. And uh, to, when you work a rural station like that, you have to wear not just so many more hats, but you have to be able to function in each of those roles a lot more than um, if you were in a larger in an urban area where you kind of get to stay in your lane. You don't really have to challenge yourself so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's something I really like about the structure of police work is that every, at least everybody has to start in patrol. You know what I mean? Like you, you were going to, you might be a quick riser or whatever, but it's not like that in the corporate world. Like it's, it's, they do what they want with whoever they want, but with, with patrol, at least, you know, and part of the frustration too, is when people ignore, they act like they never were in patrol, but you know what I mean? But you know, <laughs> everybody starts the same place and they got to mm-hmm. go through the the field training and they got to be the new guy and they got to shag calls. And then kind of, you, you can climb the ladder from there. I, I like that about patrol. There's other great things about the, the public sector too, but the, it, with the public sector, they don't really, there's no like really, it's, there's really nothing like that. You can kind of just be plopped out because you got a buddy in management, you know, what I mean? or something like that, like almost immediately. So I kind of like that mm-hmm. about police work, the kind of that proving grounds, which 
usually rings true, but that we've all dealt with the guy that got, you know, plucked out super early to detectives and then was climbing the ladder before you knew it. And you're like, this guy even ever go to a call, but it's rare. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, for me, patrol was my favorite part of my career and being a patrol sergeant will always be the, my, my favorite job in policing. Uh, I did most of my first 13 years on patrol Yeah, and uh, it's, it'll always have a special place in my heart. And it, and I, it bugs me too. when uh, people, you know, are, are looking for that promotion, looking to get to detectives or whatever, and become dismissive of what patrol really does. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of agencies out there culturally that, you know, you go back to patrol is like, look, it's looked at as like, you know, a slap on the wrist or right. uh, like that's the last thing you want to do is have to go back to patrol. Like that's the backbone of policing right there. Yeah, they're like, doing all if, the work. That's, yeah. If your skill set isn't good in patrol, then, uh, then, you know, you're going to, it's going to be a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. My dad says exactly what you just said. Cause he retired a Lieutenant and, um, he said that his favorite job ever was before he became Lieutenant, he was a Sergeant long enough that he became badge one Sergeant. And he mm. said it was the best job ever. It was great. Cause he, he had the seniority, but he was still on the patrol and he was with the, and that's how it worked on the East coast where we are is like, once you're, when you're, when you become a Lieutenant or higher, it's essentially for most departments, you you're out of the union and you're kind of negotiating your own thing with the city or the town or, or there's a admin union or something, but you're kind of, all of a sudden you're the guy that's like denying time off or ordering people or you're, you know, you're, you're now all of a sudden you're not the president of the union. You're in opposition to what they want to do sometimes. And he just, Mm -hmm. he just hated that. You know, he hated that part of it for, for where he worked. It was, um, Mm -hmm. let me take, let me set that back. He didn't hate it, but he liked being Sergeant so much better. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of like what you said. When you're a sergeant, it's, it, you have, you know, that small unit, whether you run a, just a couple of people or you run, you know, a, a dozen, but like you have the immediate ability to interact and engage and like create change. And, uh, especially as a sergeant and as a deputy, I never once left work wondering if what I did that day was worth a damn, you know, if, if I, if I contributed or not, cause I always knew I could always look back at the day and look at the stuff we did, the calls we went to, sure. the arrests we made, uh, the cases we investigated. And you're like, that was a, that was a day well spent. You know, I spent my day in a worthy cause and it's really easy to do that. As you get a little higher up, it starts to become a little more muddy in terms of like, what am I doing on a daily basis <laughs> right. to, you know, keep this community safe or contribute or be of service because yeah. it's not as apparent. And, and, and so that's, that's something that you have to navigate too, as you promote up. Yeah. I've seen some real sharp guys, um, become chiefs at like smaller agencies, like in their like late thirties. And it's like, man, and they, they end up missing it. You know what I mean? They, uh, cause you're going to sit in that once you're a chief, it's kind of like, that's it, man. It's going to, it would be weird for you to go somewhere or to go back to patrol somehow. Like you're just the chief and that's the right. next 20, 20 years of your career is you're that guy, you know, you're the kind of the, 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 the talking head of the department. You're not, you're not really, I, and I even on the radio where I used to work, I'm on the coast of Massachusetts, you'd hear when they were newly chief, stop a car and everybody's like, what is he doing? Why is he pulling cars over? Cause he misses it. You know, he wants to stop a car. Yeah. He just, he wants to get out of the office. He wants to go for a ride. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, Garrett, can you tell me the, the first time you responded to a, a call that like gave you an adrenaline dump, the first hot call you went to as a young officer? You know, it's funny. Um, cause I knew, Cause I, you know, I listened to your show. Uh, I knew you were going to ask me some version of that question. And I was thinking, okay, this question's coming up. Like what, <laughs> what do I do? And I like to blame it on 18 years. Cause it's been a long time. Uh, and, or, you know, the sleep deprivation is, has, has burned my memory, but I couldn't come up with like that first distinctive recollection, um, of like, what was the first time one, one that sticks out though, early on, uh, was, uh, a traffic accident. And it was, um, uh, this whole story is crazy. So I'll try and Perfect. keep it tight. <laughs> so, uh, it was a, it was a highway call, uh, you know, and I just, it was a, um, a vehicle versus pedestrian on the highway. And I just happened to be really close by. So, uh, I roll up, 
you know, I'm running, I'm running code and I roll up and it's probably like midnight, one in the morning, which is not a great time to be on the highway, of course, because the bars are closing at two right. o'clock. And so you're getting that kind of traffic. Right. And what had happened was a semi had pulled over on the side of the road. It had kind of broken down and the driver had popped the hood of his semi and was for some reason standing on the wheels of the truck working on his engine uh, on the, on the road side of the emergency lane. So he was kind of sticking out into the number two lane, the slow lane of the highway. And unfortunately a truck came by and sideswiped him and took him out. Ooh. And so I got there and he's, uh, the driver's already in agonal breathing, which as cops, we know that's not a good thing. Having a hard time getting a pulse. And so I start doing uh, my best version of CPR as a young, now very scared deputy right. <laughs> who's trying to deal with this problem. And some good Samaritans had pulled over who had, had seen him laying there, but he's laying in the number two lane. I'm doing the CPR and I realize I'm in traffic and I've got headlights coming at me. Yikes. Uh, and, you know, again, time of night, scary. So I uh, end up having to like drag him off to the side of the road and we're trying to work on him. Unfortunately, he ends up passing away. And the first Good Samaritan who, who uh, stopped uh, kind of described what happened. Uh, there was some damage left behind by the vehicle uh, that had hit him. And we knew it was going to be like a dark green pickup truck because a side mirror had come off. So the Good Samaritan, you know, we get his information, uh, send him on his way. He goes home. He calls us not 10, 15 minutes later and says, I just got home and I pulled into my, my apartment complex parking, my carport and my, my roommate's home and he drives a green for a uh, pickup uh -oh. and it's missing its side mirror and the side is completely scraped up. And so what ended up happening was, you know, just randomly this first guy who saw this, who was on his way home from work, he had nothing to do. He wasn't at the bars with this guy. Uh, witnesses or, or is the first one to witness or see this thing calls 911 ends up going home. And the guy that actually caused the accident caused the manslaughter death was his roommate. Wow. And uh, yeah. And so he, he called us back and we eventually went in there and arrested him. Uh, but that was a, that was a wild one. And that was very early on in my career. That is totally, what are the chances, especially in SoCal, so many places, so many people, right? It's yeah, I can't remember. imagine what the odds would have been. Yeah. Damn, that is intense. And that's scary, man. You, I mean, especially on like scene awareness, scene safety, you really can kind of lose it, especially when you're newer, when you're so concerned with someone who's dying. You're not, mm -hmm. a, that's what, you know, they, they try to drill that into you in academy, like scene safety, then the accident, you know, that type of thing. But that's not always how it goes down because we're human. You know, you see that person dying and you're laser focused. Um, yeah. Thank goodness you didn't get, get smoked. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, he, he was literally died. He died in my arms and, uh, and thankfully I didn't go with him by, you know, staying in traffic, man. That's crazy. Leads me to my next question. What is, uh, cause this one was kind of strange as well. What is the uh, strangest or most bizarre thing you've dealt with? Um, <laughs> there's so many, you know, this. like, yeah, there's just, you know, like cops who listen to this, like they, they probably won't even like raise an eyebrow because we just know that there are so many bizarre, strange things that happen from like swearing you see ghosts to like the weird calls to the things that people do to themselves. Sex uh, toys. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, and that's actually that's probably the most bizarre thing. I, um, so I don't know how uh, R rated. Uh, but I'll, no, but, uh, let it rip, brother. One there. So in my department, we're also coroner's detectives, uh, which they failed to mention in the brochure for, in the hiring process. Oh, really? That's interesting. So you go to autopsies and stuff? Yeah. So we would, we do autopsies. Well, I mean, we don't cut them open. We have a forensics pathologist who does that, but we respond to all deaths in the county and we do the death uh, investigation. And then we have a whole bureau of detectives or dedicated to coroner's uh, investigations, Ooh. but they're deputy sheriffs and they're there on a, on a specialty assignment like you would if you went to property crimes or person right. crimes. Not for me, brother. It's, well, like I said, they didn't mention this in the promotional material when I, when I was trying to get hired <laughs> right. because I was literally, like the uh, on my, I was on my ride along in the academy 
And my, uh, the, the guy who I was writing with kind of offhanded mentions, you know, corners investigations. And I was literally like, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, ew. So that was definitely not something I was, uh, I was ready for. So, okay. So bizarre, crazy story. This involves a death. Um, and you, you touched on it there with the sex toy thing. It was a, a man who had passed away. Uh, and we got a call to check the welfare like you do, like the mail's piling up. Someone that yeah. nobody's seen him for a while. And um, we, I'm trying to be nice in telling the story, but I really can't tell it without just being completely explicit. Uh, and you so, do you, man. Let it rip. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're doing the check and we get the whiff. You're like, oh, yeah, he's he's in there. Yeah. <laughs> something, something, you know. And what, end, what we, we end up finding is uh, a sunroom in back has kind of been converted into like a, a makeshift bedroom. And he had an entire room of floor to ceiling uh, DVDs of porn. And he had, had died in a, a lazy boy that he had reclined. And he had this whole system set up that he could do all the things that people do when they watch porn uh, at arm's reach. And he was very, very obese. He was about 400 pounds at least. Um, oh, boy. and he was buck naked when we, uh, discovered him. Uh, and, uh, I just remember things like he had swinging tables, uh, so that he could access his keyboard or, uh, other <laughs> oh toys. Gosh. And there were things wedged in places that you don't want them wedged, especially when you're decomping. Uh, not be wedged. And yes, a variety of, uh, <laughs> Of, of lubricant choices were within hands reach. And it was like this entire chamber of, of pornography and masturbation. Uh, and it was the gross, like, you know, ugh, you don't want to touch anything in there. Yeah. You're like gloving up your glove ups. <laughs> and um, now we got to get this guy who's seeping into the lazy boy mm. uh, because we're the, we get to, we don't get to call the medical examiner's office. Oh, you guys actually uh, move the bodies and stuff. We move the bodies oh, and everything, man. God. Yeah. I like <laughs> we stuff them into the body bags and all that. And, and so, yeah, we're trying to drag this 400 plus pound dude who's naked and loomed up and oh. decomping uh, into oh. a body bag and get him out of there. And then to have to have the conversation with his mother without, giving her a whole, uh, the, the story I just told you yeah. so that she can keep this picture of her, her son. That's, you know, not that, uh, that was, uh, definitely one of my most bizarre calls. <laughs> that is absolutely disgusting. I'm not, I mean, just give me a bloater and it's like ruins my day. Never mind all the extras you're dealing with. Oh uh, yeah. Dude, yeah. That's sad. I mean, what a sad life too. I mean, poor guy. Like he's, that's what he's resigned himself to to do is just you know he's he, oh man that's that's brutal i think those um, it is yeah i think more stories like that are they're, they're going to become more and more prevalent the way our the, the way we're headed here with technology and the overuse all that stuff and the the stimulation and the dopamine and whatever else all the smart people are saying about us and our devices you know that's like the perfect it's like almost like suicide by uh by devices by maximum pleasure or whatever yeah yeah it's like the uh what's that experiment with the uh, the rats and, and cocaine right like if you yeah. get, let them do it and they just the dopamine hit dopamine hit dopamine hit, and they just can't we're get. i agree we're going that way and it and it's doubly so because with that scrolling we're not talking to each other you know we're not interacting face to face we don't have to go out and like be humans uh and so we do end up i think we're ending up with a, a group or a generation or even just a whole society that's closed off from each other and, and we don't know how to talk to each other anymore. Yeah. It's really weird. Cause it's like for a long, long time, it was like, um, the prog the progressiveness of the culture was like sex was more permissible and all that. And it was kind of just like the way things were unraveling. And then I heard recently, there's a study that like this generation coming up now entering their teens are like delaying the first kiss. They're not, they won't hold hands. They think, sex is like weird and yucky. You know, it's almost like demolition man. You know, when they're like, he's like, she, she, Sandra Bullock wants to have uh or they want to have sex or in John Spartan, um, Sylvester Lone's character. And she's like, Oh, we don't touch. And they put these weird helmets on or whatever, kind of like cone heads. It's like, they're <laughs> it's, it's, isn't that odd though? Like it's they're all, it, it, and it's for all the wrong reasons. It's not because of purity or morality. It's because they're, they're not comfortable with other people. They're not comfortable interacting with people. Like, 
in, yeah. in person. I, you see it in, even in policing with what, what sometimes is called the COVID cops, you know, cops who came through an academy or during their training or during COVID when you're not only just discouraged, but, but really punished if you went out and made face-to-face contacts with people. Uh, and so uh, there's a whole, I think it's a small generation, but a generation nonetheless that has found a reason not to be proactive uh, to sit in the parking lot because they don't know, they didn't they ever develop a skill of talking with people that might disagree with them, that might challenge them. They never uh, got used to that idea that you just have to be nosy as a good cop. Right? I remember that being a hard one for me. Like, right? What do you mean? I'm just going to ask this guy twenty questions about where he's going, where he came from, who's who in his you know zoo, and who's that in the car, and are you on probation or parole? You've been arrested before. All this, all those things that now roll off the tongue is like standard. I got no problem getting in people's business now. Uh, but we have a whole group of young cops who never got that skill because they never got the chance to practice it during COVID. And uh, yeah, so I think that's going to be an issue for a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Cause that, that will follow that generation. And then there was like um, here anyways, there was like um, they were desperate to graduate cops. So they had like a uh, hybrid COVID Academy where it was mm-hmm. like when they could, they would get together in, in person, but then also they would, you would just, we'd have candidates just or recruits report to the station and do stuff on zoom. And mm-hmm. it was like, you know, you're getting chewed out by the DI over zoom. It's kind of like, it's, it's hilarious. It makes it like a, even more like, even if you're aware, it's just a game. It's even more ridiculous right. when it's a laptop. It's like, uh-huh. Mm-hmm, sorry. You know, it's <laughs> like, All right. what are you going to do to me? Yeah. You're, you're 20 towns away. Um, yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. That, that, that is a sad and, uh, disgusting call. I can't believe that um, I get, I don't like it when the, um, like I've said this before in the podcast, but like the, I've had the corner show up and it'd be like a little, like a small female and like need help. And I'm like, now you gotta, you gotta bring another person. Like I'm, I'm not this, mm-hmm. I don't want to be moving someone around like this, you know, cause you know, when you move them, that's when it, if it already smells, yeah. but then if I've had bloaters before that, like there was no odor, but you know, as soon as they move, things are yeah. going to start flowing and then it's it's like i have the weakest gag reflex it like runs in my family just like the like you can it's bad i have to like stop recover and then uh, you know the vix or or just breathe through my mouth but then you're breathing that through your mouth so just that idea makes me dry heave uh not would not be a good homicide guy i don't think so uh, funny yeah i've you know i've had purged burst all over me before like oh a rotisserie my, chicken sliding me. off a leg. Oh. Um, I had a case once where a guy, he had sat up in bed and then collapsed during, had a heart attack, collapsed backwards. So his feet were on the ground, but he's lying on his bed. And uh, we get there and of course he's a hoarder and it's he's got the heater on at like 80 degrees, but now it's like August and it's oh. been running for three or four months. Oh. And uh, yeah, I, 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 I was puking in the front, uh, but we go to move him. And his, yeah, his leg comes off in my arms like a rotisserie chicken leg. Oh my gosh. And out come all the maggots from his, from his crotch area that had been living inside of him and eating him from the inside out and just spilled all over me, all over my legs, my uniform. (laughs) And, and I ran outside, uh, and, and, uh, you know, it was, it was dry heaving. I don't think I'd had dinner yet, so I didn't have anything in my stomach, thankfully, but I was, I remember dry heaving so hard and the, the cop who was working with me had used to be a coroner's detective and he's like no big deal for him. And he comes out just laughing at me because just hysterical. He thinks it's hilarious. Uh, <laughs> now we're dealing with that. Yeah. There's, I got so many, so many decom stories that they're just, that's just so gross. And, and uh, one thing that's funny is, okay. So the funny part of this is that uh, at our coroner's bureau, they use a very specific like glade scented candle, smell to help cover up some of the the stench okay uh and it's the uh it's like that cinnamon smell right and so it's like really really strong and for years and years and years of my career every time you walk into that building you would just smell <clears throat> the cinnamon glade scented candle smell mixed with this weird off odor right and i come home one day this is years ago i come home one day and my wife had bought some new uh, scented <laughs> candles for the home and she had picked this cinnamon glade scented candle yeah, yeah. and I walk in my house and immediately go kind of lurch like <laughs> yeah and was like can't have that here 
Like yeah. that's not going to work. That one's not going to work for us. Like you can pick the ocean scent or the white linen or whatever, but we can't have the cinnamon uh, scented candles around. <laughs> yeah. Take it back. St- smell is powerful, man. I mean, Oh geez, dad, not the car again. No, oh, happens all the time with old Betsy. Have you checked out Carvana yet? They have thousands of cars for under $20,000. But do those thousands of cars have personality like old Betsy? Betsy's held together by tape. And there are raccoons living in the engine. Psh, it's a family car. Uh, there are flames on the hood? Ah, custom paint job. No, dad, the car's on fire. How many cars did you say Carvana had? Visit Carvana.com to shop thousands of cars for under $20,000. We'll drive you happy at Carvana. Last year, I had leukemia. Today, I have roller kickball. Kids with cancer and blood disorders can get back to being kids through our pediatric hematology and oncology program at RWJ Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. We diagnose and treat your child's cancer or blood disorder with the most advanced treatments and compassion. Learn more at rwjbh.org slash kids cancer and blood disorders. RWJ Barnabas Health and Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey. Let's beat cancer together. I remember when um, hand sanitizer became like everybody was using hand sanitizer. It always reminds me still of the booking room because like two thirds of the people are drunk and it's that alcoholy smell. So that whenever yeah. I smell hand sanitizer, someone uses it. I always think of booking a drunk. I just can't, I can't, I mean, it doesn't oh, bother, funny. it doesn't bother me, but it makes me think of it every time. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. Yeah. Um, that's funny. No, or I don't, I think the, um, the smell of cinnamon gum on people's breath, I have, I have always thought is kind of gross. I, it's not like minty. It's something about the cinnamon smell um, in gum and stuff I never like. So I would be fully on that train if uh, <laughs> I was exposed to that scenario. Damn, man. Um, Garrett. Oh, Garrett. Tell me, how do you say your last name? Tesla. Tesla. Okay. Yeah. Like, the, like the extra A is a W. I don't know how. I'm, I'm, everybody knows listening to the show. I'm notoriously bad with pronunciation so i apologize yeah it's all good um can you tell us about your uh most intense or terrifying call yeah absolutely um so one of my jobs that i've had has been as the uh <clears throat> team leader or team supervisor for our underwater search and recovery team our dive our dive unit right and i'm here on the coast we've got 110 miles of coastline in my in my county so we've got a lot of ocean water and we have some islands called the Channel Islands that are part of our jurisdiction that are about 20 miles uh, off the coast. Um, Catalina is part of that same chain for people who are familiar with the area. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, we're a little further north, but we have the Channel Islands in my jurisdiction as well. And so uh, on my anniversary of all days, in uh, September 2nd of 2019, my wife and I, it was a... Uh, It was a Monday. My wife and I were going to take the day off and go do some wine tasting and just kind of enjoy the day and celebrate our anniversary. And I woke up to my phone blowing up at about 530 in the morning uh, telling me that there was a dive boat 20 miles offshore that was burning and 34 people are presumed dead and that the boat is now sinking. And so as the dive supervisor for the team, it was now on uh, my job to figure out what to do. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It was the largest, it was, it was the largest ended up being the largest scuba dive recovery ever. We never found, we, the Coast Guard, the FBI. Oh yeah. It was called the conception, right? Mm -hmm. It was the, uh, the conception dive boat disaster in 2019. And so I've had a lot of big calls in my life. Uh, I was part of the debris flow response that killed 22 people here in 2018. Uh, I was part of the active shooter response when uh, we had a, uh, someone drove around shooting people and killing seven people in 2014. Oh yeah. But this was the first one where it was like on me to figure out how this, how, do, how do we do this? That's a lot of pressure how do we it. go? How do we go 24 miles out to sea recover hopefully recover all 34, which we eventually did over two weeks. Uh, and what are the resources I need and who can I call for help? And, you know, uh, and, and then it was a great lesson for me in understanding or, or being willing to ask for help and also understanding where my skill set ends and someone else's begins and asking for them to take control in their, you know, in their strengths. I bet. Uh, but it was, you know, that first day, 
we, it, well, what's funny is like five days before this happened, we had trained with an allied agency for a very similar style event. And we trained with them because they've got larger boats and they've got a lot of resources that we don't have. And uh, they're just great people to work with. So we've kind of developed this relationship over a couple of years. And then five days later, we uh, have this actual call. So we call them and they, of course, drop everything to go help us. And a bunch of other agencies eventually came in too. Uh, but going out there that first day and knowing that the, like, the, the ocean was calm, it was sunny, uh, and there was no evidence of a boat having sunk or been on fire, at least initially, until you start looking a little closer. Weird. And that really eerie, eerie feeling knowing that 34 people had, had just perished that morning. Just below the uh, surface. In, yeah, that's crazy. Just below the surface. Yeah, about 65 feet down at that point. And so that ended up being a search where we used, I think, 99 divers from 13 agencies. We had 15 vessels on site. Uh, it was wow. eventually a joint task force between my team and the FBI leading with Coast Guard assisting. Uh, that eventually became a criminal case that the FBI took lead on. Uh, Did the Coast Guard the, take the bodies? Is that what they were doing? No, Coast Guard provided scene security, really, and just kind of coordination. But uh, it was an incident where, again, we're the coroners, so and it was in our area. So we were we, we were recovering the victims, but then my other teams were processing the victims as well. And, uh, you know, we left that first day with 13 body bags. Wow. Uh, heading back with us to the docks. And there's some pictures that were famous at the time on the NBC Nightly News and other national news outlets um, of me and my team hoisting the, the bags onto the dock. Uh, and we uh, turned around and went back and did it again the next day and the next day after that. And we did that for, wow, I think, nine days. We had to stop because of some rough seas for a couple of days. We had one outstanding victim that we just couldn't find for the longest time. And uh, luckily, after almost two weeks, we were able to, to bring, her, uh, bring her back to her family. And so that was, that was the biggest event in my career. Uh, I think that, I, you know, there's no way to make sense of a tragedy like that where like 34 people just, you know, perished and also panicked and were you know they like they knew they were dying yeah. what and exactly happened to the boat the the belief is that people had piled the their lithium ion batteries on top of each other like you know uh, gopro cameras and cell phones and uh computers and stuff and they had to kind of work put them all in one uh jack in the kitchen and they heated up and eventually some something sparked a fire there Wow. And a, so a fire started. Everyone's already asleep down below deck. Oh. Uh, there were five, four, I can't remember, if, um, employees that were sleeping above deck that saw the fire, spotted it, did something to try and put it out, and then ended up abandoning ship. But uh, the 34 people who were below deck sleeping never were never able to escape. Wow. That's intense, man. I can't imagine the... You know, it's obviously a huge tragedy, but like I'm, I'm putting myself in your shoes and the where do you start type of thing. Like, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like when this is like your, all right, this is your baby. Let's, let's, let's get it going. That had to have been so much pressure. It was, uh, I didn't realize it at the time because I think I was just so focused, like all cops, right? Like what's your first goal is to get there, like get to right. the scene. Right. And so you don't always realize like you're driving 130 miles an hour to code three to the emergency because you're focused on wanting to get there because that's when you can start to be of help. Right. And so right. Uh, my goal was just to get out there. And when it's 25 miles out to sea, that's not the easiest thing to accomplish. And so uh, I remember like I was making phone calls on the way down, just like Google searching um, recovery companies that specialize in like salvaging stuff and like, like Tobo us and stuff like that. Exactly. Yeah. But like totally not in my, I didn't need to worry about that at that moment. Cause like that was going to be days, if not weeks later. And it was going to be a, I, it never occurred to me that this was going to be like an FBI joint task force thing, uh, that the coast guard would be there or that, 
I'd have 99 divers on site for this kind of thing. Like it was just kind of funny. Like it was, I think the culture, especially, you know, it's been policing is like, you handle it. You're, you're given a problem, you handle it. And so I was like, okay, me and my 13 divers are going to go handle it and not realizing the scope of what was, uh, what we were about to encounter. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I can imagine. I've never been in, in, um, involved in something that large. We had a plane crash, um, when I was a natural resource officer and the coast guard was there and the FAA and FBI and stuff, but they had, it was weird. I think they had like the, the main, the big parts of people went to the dock. Um, and the, any residual parts found went out to the coast guard boat. I don't know why they did it like that, but that's maybe because the FAA was in charge of doing it, but that's kind of how it worked. But, um, when you, as a police officer, when you experience a, a critical incident that large, what does the agency do for you, for you guys who obviously worked all those hours? I mean, there's a, there's a debriefing, I'm sure. Do they, in California, they offer a, uh, they just say, Hey, just, you know, do you need some days off or what do they offer up to you to just kind of get you back to neutral, you know? Yeah. You know, it's getting better. And I think that situations like this and the debris flow that I mentioned before, like, those have show, shown a light on the need to consider these things. We've, my agency has been doing the critical incident debriefs for a number of years. Um, I personally don't find them to be helpful and they can actually be very, um, uh, a negative experience for a lot of officers, depending on how they're, they're done. Some people and really so, break down during them too. And it kind of makes you relive that a little bit. You know what I mean? It kind of, it makes it stressful. I, I, not, not anything against, people who have to get something out, but I know what you're saying. I, right. I feel the same way kind of. Well, and I don't want to like, I don't want to uh, throw any shade towards the idea of therapy or counseling at all, because I've, I've went through, I've done all of it. Like <laughs> I've, I've tried Absolutely. everything and I've done everything and I've, I've been in, you know, I was uh, shortly before the conception, you know, I was diagnosed with PTSD. And so it was I'm kind sure. of like navigating that and struggling with that and like trying to figure out, my path through those things. Uh, my, my concern with like the debriefs is that if you don't have a culturally competent person running it, uh, it's just a check mark to say for the agency to say they did it. Okay. And yeah. then you need, you really need buy-in from your, your administration that it's valuable. And the, what that requires usually is that they stay the hell away. Right. And like, you're not going to have a successful debrief with a group of people who all have to trust each other uh, and, but also have to go to work together. And like the next one might be tomorrow. That's the thing about this job is like the next thing, the next conception might be the next day. Right. And we still hold on to this idea that we have to show that we're ready at all times and we're able to handle it. And when, you know, so those debriefs can really devolve into just a lot of posturing, particularly if command staff shows up for them. Uh, and if the command staff's there to show their support, like, cool, but then leave, yeah. you know, but no, I know as a Lieutenant now, I know that if I ask a group a question, I'm going to get different answers than if I ask individuals. Uh, and so it's, kind of, that's kind of what my hangup is with the, the debriefs. It's not that they're not, it's not valuable to talk. It is, it's valuable to talk to someone who has some, some skills and some training and how to navigate those things, but it just has to be done the right way. Um, I so yeah, my, I, yeah, I just kind of, I use my own stuff. Uh, I have, you know, my podcast is really basically about personal development and like navigating a lot of the traumas and stuff like that and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. And so I think I had a pretty good handle on it uh, by that point. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it's, it's always a work in progress. And as, as long as you stay in the job, it's like a perishable skill is our mental health. You got to stay on it. Yeah, absolutely. I've had some recent episodes um <clears throat> with officers sharing their PTSD and stuff like that. And it's, it's like, it's critical, especially to hang on to keep people being able to do the job. And sometimes you can't, sometimes people just have to leave cause it's, it's too much, but sure. um, yeah, it's, it, and isn't it, I, one of my earliest episodes I did was a Inglewood um, officer and he was worked gangs and stuff. And he saw, of course, crazy things, but he was also a Marine. And he, he, he said the hard thing about police work to like get a handle on was, when you're overseas on a mission, it comes to an end and you come home, which is still hard. And there's still mm -hmm. things they deal with. 
he said when he worked for Inglewood for all those years, it, it was never over. Like you know what I mean? That like you said, you have to be ready for the next thing. So you do something crazy, you see something insane, you almost get killed, you're involved in shoot whatever it is, and you're sitting there eating he would say, just sitting there eating supper thinking, This is tomorrow now. Like this is like I I'm going to do it again. You're looking at your family, but you're like you're going essentially to him in his mind it was like going to war again. Like you're never not going to war um when you're constantly subjected yeah. to those calls with no break, you know? Absolutely. I've had tier one operators. Like I've, I've interviewed guys from SEAL Team 6, from Delta, from Green Berets over and over and over again. And to a man, they all say, I don't know how you do it. I couldn't do that job. Right. And, and they, and they almost always point to that idea that it's, it's back again tomorrow. Yeah. It's just part of your, that's, it's your job. Literally. <laughs> that's, that's it. So do yeah. You, anyway, if, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Garrett. I've, I was just gonna say like, it's, think, think about like if, if they were open and honest at the, at the police academy or in the recruitment process about what you will experience and then the challenges you might, not always, but you might can be, have to confront with that idea that it's over and over again. Like people wouldn't come to work the next day, right? So it's like it's almost built into the system that we have to pretend it's not here. It's not a thing. And we have to pretend that we've, we're good. You right. know, in air quotes and that because no one else, no one's going to come to work if that's the case every day. Uh, and so there's, and it's just, it's not a, a negative about the industry. It's like, it's just kind of a part of how we have to function. It's very bizarre. Yeah. It's kind of a delicate balance, right? Cause you want people to keep doing it, but you also want to support them <clears throat> and not have a, a, you know, a counselor or a clinician tell them right. to leave the job <laughs> you know, because it, right. it's going to happen right. to everybody. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that, that's super interesting. Um, before I ask you the the next one, I, w I was curious to ask about the TEDx talks. Um, how how is that? That, that seems, I mean, I, I watch those sometimes. They're they're super captivating, depending on the speaker. But how long have you been doing that? I just did the one, uh, and it was in 2018. It was it was a result of the debris flow, and it was my it was a kind of a, it was a conversation about my experience uh, there, and um, so it's it's interesting because. I, I, I don't have a fear of public speaking. I know a lot of people do. So I guess it's one of my skill sets, but nonetheless, when you do a Ted talk, it's all memorized. It's all, you know, there's no teleprompters. There's no screen. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. The Ted rules, like if you follow them anyway, which is my, the people who put on the one I did followed them. Like you're not supposed to have like uh, visual aids or a PowerPoint to reference and that sort of stuff. So it's all based on memory. So you know, there's probably a hundred hours of practice yeah. into the talk for 13 minutes just to make sure that I stayed on it. Because the last thing I wanted to do, of course, was vapor lock and, and freeze out. up. But it was, yeah. yeah, but it was a wonderful experience uh, to to get to do that. I got to speak on the same stage on the same day as a really good friend of mine. That was a great experience. Uh, got a great reception. And I was just talking about how uh, the ta the talk was titled the importance of second responders, but it was really about how in the aftermath of this major debris flow, how regular citizens just kind of stepped up and filled the holes uh, in that social net that we couldn't accomplish. Oh, cool. And that that was the only way out of this problem was in that. And I used some examples from like nine 11 and some homeless issues in LA of just examples of people kind of doing what they can. And this idea that, you know, we as first responders can't do our job unless people step up as a second responder in whatever way they're able to in their private lives. Right. Like the fire department, second responders. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to make a second responder. Guys. Guys. Yeah. <laughs> we love you. We know you're good. Um, all right. That's very interesting. Um, Garrett, can we shift gears here? Can you tell us about a heartwarming encounter you've had on the job? Mm, you know, luckily I, I have a lot, you know, and um, I still love interacting with like elementary school kids, you know, cause they, they don't hate us yet. They haven't been in, unless they have an older brother, they don't have this perception of right. us and they just, they just love seeing us. I'm the same. I so love the fun. kindergarten class, man. The best. Can I see your gun? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> yeah. I will go talk to, uh, uh, elementary school age kids all the time. Um, and so like recently we had a swatting call here where, uh, you know, 
someone claimed that there was a man, uh, that, that there was a shooting on our high school campus. That's actually pretty close to my house. And so it sounded legit at the time. So of course everybody rolls and it's chaos. And, you know, we figure out pretty quickly that it was a swatting, but the, the, the local elementary schools in the area had to be put on lockdown. And one of those was my son's elementary school. And it's in the, it's pretty close to this area. So after everything settled down, I just happened to be working a patrol shift that day. So I was in like full patrol uniform, not in my lazy Lieutenant outfit and, uh, Colster and cuffs. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) Uh, and so I decided, you know, I'm going to roll by his, his, uh, school. Cause I just, they were in lockdown for quite a while. And, you know, this is just an example because there's so many heartwarming examples, but this one was just like, I, I felt like that was where I needed to be that day was like, these kids had just been like, you know, lights off in the dark, having this experience. They're not being told what's going on, but they know it's scary and they know what a lockdown is for. Sure. Is it on their campus or it's not? And so it was just uh, a great moment to interact with these kids, let them know everything's fine. They got to see the cop who was walking around smiling big right. instead of, you know, gun out and helmet on and talk to the teachers and just remind them that, you know, we're there and, and uh, we take it seriously and, you know, everything's fine. It was, it was a big false alarm on this one. And what I've developed throughout my career is I guess an awareness or an ability to be aware of those moments as they're happening uh, so that, the heartwarming stuff happens pretty frequently That's when you understand, you know, when you, when you can go to work and understand like, this is what I'm meant to do or that I'm supposed to be here at this moment for this purpose, whether it's a, a a death notification or it's saving someone from themselves, like that idea that we're, we're, this is exactly where I'm supposed to be in the world. um, That will give you that sense of that heartwarming story without the need for any input from anybody else. Cause you take it with you wherever you go. Absolutely. That's beautiful, man. I love that. Great. Uh, great heartwarming Thank story. You. Um, Garrett, a uh, popular question here, advice to new police officers, people thinking about it, people on the fence, people in police Academy and backgrounds. What would you say to them after all your years of experience? I would say that you need to come in with a realistic understanding of what you might face. Uh, and so do ride alongs. Uh, I think, uh, the book emotional survival for law enforcement is really a book that everyone should read when they, before they become a cop. Uh, I hand that book out to everybody who gets assigned to my station, but I think it's a book you should be reading before you get in the Academy. Uh, My first time read it or first time reading it. I thought, Oh, that sucks to be that guy, but man, I'm lucky that's not me. And then the second time I read it went, Oh, that's been me the whole time. Oh yeah. So, (laughs) So you, you may not be receptive to the ideas, but you should at least be aware of them, of these ideas of hypervigilance and hypervigilance and, and the, how it uh, interacts with your body and your mind and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, then understand like, why is it you're coming into the job? Uh, and are you here because you want to serve and you want to be part of something larger than yourself and you have a vision for uh, contributing something in a positive way? Great, then do it. Um, if this is a job that you're looking at because, uh, the pay is good and you got, uh, no other options, trust me, there's other options out there that are far more, uh, better for your family or your own health or your own relationships than this job. This, this, I'm corny and I still think this is a calling. Like you can't do this job. You can't work a Tuesday night at three in the morning and just say that it's a job. And the people that do are either hiding because they're not comfortable with the idea that of being so passionate about it or they probably need to leave the profession because I wouldn't have been able to do this job if it was just a job. Uh, But if you have a sense of who you are and what you want to be in the world and it involves being in service to others, then this is the greatest job on earth. Absolutely, man. I agree a hundred percent. Garrett, thank you for coming on, man. It was an honor to have you. Where can people um, find your podcast and find you on social media? Right above your head there. I have the, the Instagram. Is there a website as well? Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. This has been a lot of fun and I've uh, been looking forward to it after all the scheduling snafus we had to deal with. Right. So thank you. It was great. Uh, yeah. At the squad room on social media, uh, the squad room.net is my website. There's some uh, resources there. There's some free uh, downloads and some uh, things that people can look at there. And then the web, the podcast is the squad room and that's available wherever anyone can get their podcasts. Awesome. And check out the Ted talk. 
I'm going to check and that the TED out. Talk on YouTube. Yeah. yeah, very cool. Thank you, sir. I'm going to do the outro here. Um, can you hang out or do you have to be somewhere? I do have to be somewhere, actually. Okay. Well, we'll but I, I would love to do a follow up if you want. Okay, great, man. Yeah, absolutely. Let's let's keep in touch. And um, I'll do the outro here and have a good night, brother. It was an honor, like I said. A lot of fun. Thank you. Take care. Ladies and gentlemen, the great Garrett Tesla, man. Um, I'm not sure I could handle what that guy's handled, but uh, it, it was an honor to have him on. It was uh, really, really great stories. And I hope you enjoyed it like I did. Guys, thank you. Like I said before, the rating and the reviewing is fantastic. And if you love the show and you want to support it, uh, keep the boat afloat. Patreon's a place to do that. You can get there in the show notes. There's a link to it. Also, I will link all Garrett's stuff in the show notes so you can find him easily right there. And today is the part of the show when I like to thank the Patreon sponsors and who I'm talking about. These are the sergeants on the Patreon level. I'm talking about the great Sarah Pomroy, Andy Biggs, Greg Gadboy, Adam Mihal, the great Chris June, Gary Steiner, Jake Pinedo, John Shoemaker, Lauren Stimson, Lane Campbell, he's a handsome man, Seth Wright, William James Long, that's Deputy William James Long to you, sir, James Rose, Tony Fahey, the great Ben Peters, Braden Walker, Corey Payne, Jason Lau, the great Mike Wynn, Nathan Gowan, Sasha McNabb, the great Scott Minkler, the great Tammy Wall, Sean Clifford, just Dennis because he only put his first name, the Motor Cop Chronicles podcast hosted by Iceman, George Tessier, Nick Noose, Scott Young, the great Tom Connell, Wayne M. Miller, Dan Carlson from Burley Boards, Doug and Kelly Newman, love you guys, Joe DeVries, Dave Elman, Elliot Sykes, the great Holly Vanover, Richard Tolls, love you buddy, Brittany Sims, thank you for the support, Christian, because that's all he wants me to say, and Jace Crow. You guys are great. Uh, I love that you support the show the way you do, and you truly, truly help me out. You it enables me to pay for all the services I need to keep the show going. Equipment failures, which I've had plenty of lately, is all um, is all taken care of because uh, people support the show through Patreon. So if you love the show, that's the place to do it, guys. Well, that's the show for this week, and I will see you next time. Take as little as three minutes to see if you could save on motorcycle insurance with Progressive. Come on, you've spent more time than that thinking about helmets with faces on them. I should get a new helmet. Ooh, maybe I'll get one of those ones that looks like a face with painted teeth and eyebrows, you know? Oh, that always looks so cool. People are like, whoa, is that a person with two faces? Oh, no, it's a helmet. And one face. Get a quote in as little as three minutes at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates.